Welcome to ACF Chefs Forum. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to have an expert here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, I'd like to thank New Hampshire and Massachusetts ProStart, as well as our ACF sponsor, Smithfield Culinary, for allowing us to bring you such a great educational opportunity for professional development for chefs and culinary students. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Pariso, and New Hampshire ProStar is very happy to welcome all of you to today's demo. I hope you're ready to be inspired by this taste of autumn as we discuss what menu items are hot as the weather cools down. I know I can't wait, and I'm jealous that some of you are going to cook along with Chef. We will be taking questions live during this webinar as we are able to. Please be sure to use the chat function to collaborate with other chefs and students tuning in and the Q&A function to post questions to today's featured chef. Let's get that discussion going on the chat. Please let us know where you're tuning in from today. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Almeida from Massachusetts ProStar and we are also very happy to welcome you all to today's demo. We are excited to have such a talented culinarian here to inspire us. A little background about today's featured chef who is a great supporter of young and aspiring culinarians. Chef Nicholas, I always say his last name wrong, Callius, C-E-C-C-E-A, is a director of food and beverage at the Colonnade Hotel in Boston. Nick started his culinary career as a fry cook at his father's restaurant, Nichols Country House in Seabrook, New Hampshire, when he was just 11 years old. In 2013, he received Chef of the Year honors from the Epicurean Club of Boston ACF chapter. And in 2015, he won the Chef of the Year Award from the Massachusetts Restaurant Association. And in 2017, Nick also received the Raphael Oliver Award for his support of the Education Foundation. Chef Nick has previously held many culinary leadership roles and he is dedicated to aspiring the next generation of chefs. In fact, he sits on multiple culinary boards supporting students from high school to college, including the board here at the MRAEF. Chef is very involved in raising money for scholarships for students, and he is the lead judge for the Massachusetts Pro Start competition. We are excited for Nick to represent Massachusetts chefs here today. I know I'm excited to see him in action in the kitchen, and now I'll pass it back to Jackie to kick off today's session. Well, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships. And if you'll be cooking along with us today, please send me a message in the chat so we can feature your dish on screen. Don't be shy. I first met Chef when we were judging ProStart Nationals and we've been friends and colleagues ever since. Thanks for being with us here today from downtown Boston. And uh, Chef, if you could please tell us a little bit more about your demo and why you wanted to be here today to share your expertise with the chefs and culinary students who are tuning in from New England and beyond. Excellent, hi, thank you, welcome um, to my kitchen. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Smithfield Culinary for sponsorship of our uh, demo today as well. Um, as Jennifer said, I'm on the board of directors for the uh, EF in Massachusetts and pro star, lead judge. It's really, really important um, for us chefs to give back to all the high school kids and the college kids and different kids and young individuals going up in this field. Um, so whatever I, I can do and the rest of my chef friends, we all can do for to help support the younger chef uh, community. We're always here for it. So today we're doing... Um, a little pork. So it's fall season. We think apples, we think squash, we think sweet potatoes. Um, we think those things because that's what, you know, is everyone's getting right now. So one of the dishes that I like to do, I make this at home a lot. I make this at work. Um, it's been a staple on menu for many, many years is a simple um, steak river farms pork chop. We're going to do that with a sweet potato puree, a grain of paradise glaze, which is a yummy sticky glaze with coriander and grains of paradise and fennel orange juice and coffee. Um, and then we do some ladons of bacon and then some Brussels sprouts. In the recipe, I do have it as uh, sous vide. So you can cook it at 137 for you know a couple of hours and then let it sit. Sous vide cooking you know, is, is a wonderful thing to play with. Um, if you haven't had the chance to do it, circulators are definitely coming down in price. Um, a lot of things fun at home. I know I have three circulators at home, so I play with it a lot at home. Keeps everything at a nice consistent temperature. But if you're not and you're serving at home, that's fine. Hot pan, I'll explain that as we go. But a hot pan, you want to cook it to about 140 degrees, let it rest. You hit about 148 and it's perfect. A little pink is good. 
That means it's cooked perfection. So I'm here with my sous chef, Shai. Come to the camera real quick, say hi. Um, Johnson Wales graduate, just started with us uh, a, a couple months and we're ecstatic to have Shai with us. So she's gonna, Shai's gonna be our camera person today. So we're gonna start with a couple of things. So first we're gonna start with our ladons. So we have a smoke, thick cut smoked bacon, as you can see, right? Ladons are typically thick cut bacon that is rendered down and you get the nice little fat and um, let that cook slowly. So we're gonna take that, we're gonna, just gonna cut it. You can use any kind of bacon. I like bacon. I'm a, you know, I'm a, one of those bacon fanatics. So you can have it nice and big if you want. You can use cherry smoked, apple smoked, hickory smoked. It's really up to you what kind of bacon you want to use. But we use the bacon for many things. We're going to render the fat out of the bacon and we get nice and crispy. We're also going to take some of that fat and we're going to use it in some of the other dishes that we're preparing today. So we have a pan already in the pot. I'm going to hit that little sizzle. Now you're going to render the fat out of it. You're going to add a little bit in there, a little oil, just give it a little help. We're going to turn the heat down a little bit. And we'll let it go. That's going to cook for a little bit. And that's really going to render down and get nice and crispy and get fatty and get um, just yummy goodness. That's all I can say. Now, if anyone has any questions out there, please ask away during the during the demo. We don't have to wait to the end. I'm always I can multitask. It's pretty good. So that's good. while that's going, I have some water here that's getting to a little slow simmer. We're gonna add a little salt to it, right? And then I have some sweet potatoes here that have already peeled for our puree. We're gonna cut them in half. Like so. Try to be as even as you can with your cuts. That way they cook the same time. And this is probably one of my favorite trays. Even when I'm at home, I'm not a big, hey, let's have a lumpy mashed potato type of guy. I don't know how you all like your potatoes out there, but I'm a smooth potato guy. So I'm gonna take the potatoes, I'm gonna put them in the water. Like regular potatoes, the water temperature is fine. There's not that much starch in those sweet potatoes. So they keep rendering up. As you see, the fat is really starting to mold the bacon. And that's, I don't know what we're looking for there. Two potatoes are cooking, we're gonna get that up on high, we let that cook. So even at home, I'll take the sweet potatoes and I'll rice them or I'll take my mashed potatoes and I'll rice them and then I'll whip it. I want it smooth. For this dish, they really want to be smooth. The way we're going to present it is kind of going to be like a, not necessarily a smear, but a rake. So we have a, you know, a little pastry cone we're going to use. See, it's all ridged and that's going to add to the presentation of the plate. Well, that's cooking. We're going to start a grain of paradise space. In here, we have the poppy seeds, the grain of paradise. We have coriander. We have all kinds of little spices in there. We're going to take that. We're going to put it in there and let it toast a little bit. We'll let that toast. We'll let the oils kind of get out of that. And you see our bacon getting all nice and happy. Turn the heat down a little bit. I want to burn it. Just want it to cook. We're going to toast all of our seeds, really get those flavors and aromas coming through. Um, and then we're going to add a bunch of different liquids. We have coffee, we have fish sauce, honey, orange juice. Um, let's put it. Any questions so far? Yes, we have we have plenty of questions coming in so far. I think one of them um, is pretty relevant because we have chefs and culinary students tuning in from across the country. I'm wondering if you could let us know a little bit more about the hotel and also how you get inspired to create fall menus. Absolutely. So the hotel is right in downtown Boston, the heart of the Back Bay. 
Uh, it's been it. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this month, actually. So it's been around for a little bit. You know, when I think of venues, I typically sit, try to sit down with my team, my chefs, my sous chefs. We'll sit down because I've learned over the years that the collaboration is so much better than the individual. Because, you know, when I grow, they grow. When they grow, I grow. So we sit down, we kind of think about, okay, what's great in season? We talk to our local vendors a lot. Okay, we know we're getting eight point squash, butternut squash, herbert squash. You know, what kind of meats? We'll talk to the different um, vendors, the Dottanian or Neely Meats or Masters in uh, Prime in New Jersey and seeing what the farms are doing. And, you know, obviously when people think fall, they think pork, they think uh, turkey, they think duck, they think things going from fall to winter. So when we create our menus, we don't want to change our menu every month and a half. So we'll go like in fall and then tweak in December to go to a winter. Because a lot of the flavors kind of coincide. We'll go from apples, pears, cranberries to citrus. So the seasonality is very, very, very important. And then we'll play with it. And we'll play with dishes for a while. Uh, I will sit there and, you know, last night I'm sitting on my farmer's porch having a glass of wine, just writing recipes, send it to my, sous, my chef de cuisine. I'm like, hey, what if we do this? And she's like, hey, aren't you off? <laughs> yep. But, you know, as a chef, you never stop thinking. I read a lot um, and we try to keep up with trends. So when we come up with the fall menu, we know those flavors people are going to want. They're going to want apples. They're going to want pears. They're going to want cinnamon. They want nutmeg, cloves. Um, pork, duck, goose, cranberries, those things like that, we try to mimic our menus around the entire package. And then we come up with like six dishes and we'll use two because we'll plate it and plate it and plate it and plate it and keep going with it. So now what I'm going to do is now that the seeds are toasted, I'm going to add some coffee. Fish sauce, little orange juice, and some nice sticky honey. Greek honey preferred, just because I'm Greek and it's the best honey in the world. We're going to mix that up. Turn the heat up a little bit. And we're gonna let that simmer and get nice and sticky and perfect. Another question. Okay, well, one of the other questions is um, from a student and they were wondering what your advice might be for aspiring culinarians who are coming into the industry during a difficult time. Love what you do. Understand the time right now is difficult. We all get it. We all feel it as chefs, cooks, mentors, trainers, hiring managers. We understand the times are tough right now. We as an industry will get through this. We're a resilient industry that have been here forever, right? Everyone has to eat. So it's not something you can really live without. So love what you do, read, never stop having faith that the chefs that are here now are trying to inspire younger chefs and younger cooks to come to culinary school, to come play with us. Stage in the kitchen, call one of your local restaurants up and say, hey, can I come in and just work for the afternoon? And just go and experience it. Because if you want to be a chef, once you get that bug, you're going to keep wanting to do it and do it and do it and do it. But again, I understand the times are difficult, but they will get better. I promise you. That's why we are still doing this. That's why we still have an ACF and a, and a pro start and those different programs and curriculums to help students understand the importance of what we do and what we offer to the entire country. You think about where a third of the entire country's workforce. There's a reason for that. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. And one of the other questions that has just come in as well is wondering if this recipe translate, translates into um, high volume service as well, if you were doing a banquet or um, how you might recommend um, scaling that up or, or different ways of service for this dish. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, when, when I was growing up in this business as um, uh, executive chef for hotels and hotels for 25 plus years, um, I made my name for banquets um, through uh, in Boston and Stanford, Connecticut, and California, and everything I did with the banquet food. So all my recipes everywhere will always be translated to banquets. Um, I think I'm at a larger scale. So if I can do it for one, I can do it for 2,000. It's the same, same exact thing, same, just a lot more hands. Um, but yeah, so if I was doing this for 100 people or 200 people, the sous vide and the pork chops would be the best way to go. 
because then you would take them out, cut them down, season them, sear them up, and go. And if not, we would just do it the same way in our combi ovens, but we would cook it down to 135 degrees and let it rest. Because again, at the end of the day, you don't want pork dry. But the sweet potato, yep, instead of doing you know eight ounces, we're gonna make 30 pounds. All the proceeds and all the methods of this thing are the same. So we don't change it just because it's a smaller or larger amount. That just means we use larger equipment. Instead of a Vitamixer, we're gonna use the ricer. And those procedures just change a little bit. Instead of making a cup of sauce, we're gonna make two gallons of sauce. And the way we plate up dinners here, everything's live. There's no hot boxes, there's no covers. It's all hand service. So we're plating one dish like you would in a restaurant and you're gonna go. So the way you see a plate is exactly how we would plate it for banquets and we would go. So enabling us, you know, not using covers enables us to add garnish, add decoration, make the plates look like you just had dinner. I would tell everyone, I serve restaurant food in a banquet setting, I don't serve banquet food. I love that. What a, what a, what a great uh, way to look at menus and menu writing. Um, Chef, I know uh, Jen had mentioned that you also judge quite a bit as well. Um, especially for students. And I'm wondering if you might share some general tips that you might have for those who are going into competition. So going to competition like pro style, and um, Jen could attest to this, dessert wins. Think dessert, because I I'm a natural judge as well. So one year I judge appetizers. And after the 27th ceviche, they all taste the same. So it's hard to decipher what's great, what's good, what's okay, what needs more. Then I changed after two years of doing hors d'oeuvres and appetizers to dessert. Best thing I ever did. Now, every dessert is different. Not one is the same. Now, everybody might use pear. Great. Yeah, everyone might use apple. They may use cranberry. They may use nougat, they use chocolate or coffee. It doesn't matter. None of them are going to taste the same. So really put emphasis on dessert. I know when I do the, when I'm judging in Massachusetts and I go, you know, talk to the students, you know, Jen and I would tell them the same thing. Worry about what your dessert is looking like. Just a brief end real quick. You see it's getting nice and sticky. It's exactly what we're looking for. It's exactly what we're looking for. It's gonna get a nice sticky little glaze. So we're gonna pull that off and let that sit down for a couple seconds. Our bacon is doing well also. But yeah, so don't, and, and also mint is not an edible garnish. It's edible, yes, it's a garnish, yes. Don't put it on your dessert plates on Pro Stock. Every judge I've ever been part of in all the national competitions of judge have taken it off. Like, why do we have mint? You know, make it sure everything that goes on your dish, if it's pro or any other competition, has a purpose. It has to be there for a reason or that dish isn't complete. Another little quick tidbit that I noticed a lot of the students were doing was using gold. That's great. Make sure it's edible. We disqualified two desserts last pro at nationals because the gold wasn't edible. Can't taste it, can't judge it. So those are those little tips, but concentrate on dessert. Use dry ice, use silicone molds, make a parfait, make a um, pot de creme, or make get, you get some cool silicone molds and you can put mousse in there and dry ice and freeze it and put a baked cake on there and make cool little decorations. Um, those are really cool. Sugar work. People love sugar work. The more you can impress with dessert, the better your overall score is going to be. Because all the other judges look at that too. And they're like, oh, what did they do? Oh, look at the little swirl they made. Or look at that mold. How'd they make that? You get, if you can get us talking about how you did your dish, you're going to do very well in the competitions. Excellent. Wow. Okay. So we do have a lot of questions that are, um, are coming in. Uh, one of them is, uh, what, what do you find is the biggest mistake that you see when people are learning how to cook pork? Um, oh, well, overcooking is for one. Everyone always thinks, you're grown up thinking this, right? It's great. It's done. So wrong. <laughs> Gray meat is never good, period. No matter what you're cooking, gray meat is never good. Because um, my mom used to do it too. Hey, the pork's done. Yeah, and you're like, it's tough. You don't want that. Your pork should be, you know, medium. It should be pink, 137, 140. The proper temperature is 145 to serve, five, serve six. Got it. Great. You can serve it at 140, 137. It's not raw. It's a little, so when you sous vide, it keeps it at that temperature and you open it like, wow, it's a little pink, but it's cooked perfectly. And you want that, you want that moisture to stay in there and be retained in there. And also don't cut it quick, just like a steak, let it rest. Let the juices stop, let them relax, let them go back into the meat. So then when you slice it, it stays dry. So if you slice your pork chop and there's juice all over the board, that's gonna be dry. Let it rest just like you would a steak, but don't be afraid if there's a little pink. Now, pink and raw are totally different. 
right? If it's Whitley and pink, it ain't cooked. But if it's firm and cooked, it's perfect. Excellent. Okay. Well, it looks like we have another question that is coming in too. Um, obviously, people see that you have this this great role at the hotel, and um, you know we heard a little bit about your bio, but they're wondering a little bit more about the process of what it took to uh, for you to become an executive chef and and uh, what training you received specifically. Well, so when I was 11 years old, my dad bought a restaurant, right? And he said, "Hey, do you want to dishwash? You want to cook?" I'm like, "I'm 11. I want to cook." Um, so I started off fry cooking with my dad. By the time I was 14, I was running his restaurant. I was in eighth grade doing about 80 covers a night in his restaurant. Um, and I just fell in love with it. My eighth grade ambition was to be a chef. So I had a head start going to Pawnee School. I went to Pawnee School for Newbury College in, in Boston, and I had a head start. So when I went to Pawnee School, I did my internships out of Sheraton. Um, I did all that stuff. I went to a private country club for about a year, became a sous chef. But I always did more when I was in my internship. Like I would take tinfoil wrap it in silverware, cover it in chocolate, and make chocolate silverware to go with desserts. Just to impress the chef. Just because I'll, I want to look what I, and I'd run it over to the executive chef. I'm like, look what I did. He's like, great. I'm supposed to be making salads? Yeah, yeah, I get no salads right now. So I always was that ambitious. And he saw that. And uh, after I graduated, he asked me to be the, sa the saucier for the hotel. That was great. You know, I just got out of school. I knew all my mother's sauces. And that was fantastic. I did all that. And then I became an executive chef at 22 of a fine dining restaurant in New Hampshire. But New Hampshire didn't have all that much. And, and in, as far as um, a lot of restaurants that were doing higher end food. So it was a restaurant called Ron's Beach House that just closed. I reopened it as the Beach House, which is a fine dining restaurant. Um, it's no longer there, but we got the third highest score ever on the Phantom Gourmet. It was in the papers and it was great. It was the early 90s. And then the GM that I was the uh, saucier and banker chef for at the Sheraton got bought by Starwood. He was there. He sent the chef from that whole restaurant, that hotel rather, to come bring me back as the exec sous to take over as the exec chef for the year. So he came, he had dinner at my restaurant, called me up the next day, brought me down, they offered me a job on the spot. Um, and I took it because I loved hotels. And then I became the executive chef at the Sheraton Firm at 24. I, had a ten, I ran a $10 million banquet facility. I was the youngest executive chef in Starwood in the region. And then I met the corporate chef and I started doing things with him. He sent me to Baton Rouge to open Sheraton Baton Rouge. He sent me to Sheraton Boston to do things and help set him up things. And then I became chef representative for all of New England and Pittsburgh. Not sure why Pittsburgh, but that's what he gave me. And I was 24. Uh, so I did that. And then my biggest break was the Sheraton got sold to uh, HEI Hotels. Two times almost done. To HEI Hotels. And I met a gentleman named Karim Lacani, who was trained by Ulan Ducasse in France. Um, he's a mentor to me. He saw what I did and pulled me aside and said, you need to work more with me. So he made me the task force corporate chef, and I oversaw all 30 hotels across the country, um, based out of Stanford, Connecticut. And I had a blast doing GM conferences, making menus for all the hotels, and just really kind of opening restaurants and just learning from him. The most brilliant food and beverage mine I've ever worked in my life. Um, and to this day, we're still the closest friends. I saw him, he was here two weeks ago for dinner. I uh, flew in from Denver. And uh, that's where it kind of all started. My banquet world started. And then I've been a chef ever since. I came to the Colonnade in 2006 as the executive chef. Um, within six months, I was the corporate chef. And within a year, I was the corporate chef and director of food and beverage for 13 years. Um, really made a name for this hotel and the food industry here. And then I left, I went to the Lions Group, and I was the culinary director, and I oversaw 33 restaurants in five states. That was fun. Over the pandemic, it was a little rough, um, as everyone else knows. And then the uh, vice president here called me, who was another one of my mentors and a close friend. He's like, hey, uh, we're opening back up. Can you just come open everything? And this is home to me, so I came home. That's my story. Well, it's quite a story, and um, and and shout out too from a, a fellow Newbury alum as well. So um, I um, I did have another question that came in. If you'll just take this one more, I know yep. then you'll jump back um, into getting your recipe um, uh, finished. But one of the other questions was about uh, with the supply chain issues that we're feeling right now. How is this affecting how you're planning your fall and uh, winter holiday menus? That's a fantastic question because. The supply chain is outrageous, right? I have beluga butter on my menu. It's sitting on a dock in New York City for the last six and a half weeks, and I still can't get my butter. Um, meat, 
Filet mignon is $42 a pound. Lobster cooked meat is $85 a pound. Your to-go boxes are, you know, $95 a case. Chicken wings are $175 a case. It, it's very challenging. You got to think out of the box. You got to think different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to raise your prices. And you get comments, hey, why is my the steak cost too much? So, you know, we went away from play. I don't have to play on any of my menus. Just because we can, I can't put an eight ounce filet and charge you $65 and feel right, knowing that's the only way I can make money. So we have to be creative. We use, you know, hango steak, we'll use um, tres major, we'll use uh, flank or skirt, we'll get sirloins and we'll try to cut things, fabricate things ourselves, uh, which is also not easy because of the chef store, um, shortage in staffing. So we're trying to get those lesser cut um, proteins, but the other problem is those proteins aren't getting produced as much because of the shortages in the factory. So chicken breast, chicken wings are getting produced like that. Chicken thighs, chicken legs are on the back burner because it's a secondary cut. So to me to make cocovan, my chicken legs now cost me eight dollars a pound instead of two. So it, it, it's 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 challenging. The best way to do it is really talk to your vendors, talk to your suppliers, see where they're getting, see what they have, see what's on allocation. If you say, you know what, hey, we have 10 pismos coming, they're gonna be a great price. Buy all 10, put them in the freezer if you have. Do what you can to be smart and be ahead of it. You should be thinking today for your December menus. If you're thinking December for December menus, you're in trouble. So you always got to be three months. So right now, we're talking December menus and January menus and even February menus from in, in here. So you always have to be ahead of the game on that. So here we have a pan. We're going to add a little oil. Okay. We have a mixture of grandma sal and Aleppo pepper here, which is uh, one of my favorite spices going on. So we're gonna, this pork chop's already been sous vide. So it already has everything I want on it. I'm gonna add a little salt, a little pepper. We're gonna let that cook. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of the fat We're gonna add some of that bacon fat because everything tastes better with bacon fat. No matter what everyone tells you, everything tastes better. We're gonna cook that with that cook through. Potatoes are done. So, two sweet potatoes, all nice and tender. There's still a little liquid in there, which is perfect. We'll bring it over to our blender and we'll set the cook. Let's turn it down a little bit and then it's firm. That in there. Uh, and we have some nice raw butter. Second, so this is the color you want on your pork. You want to get nice and caramelized. You want to get all there. Now, at that point, we're going to add a little fresh thyme. We're also going to add a little shallot. Dip. I'm gonna add some more butter because everything does taste better with butter. We're going to just taste the pork. So all the, we want the butter to really have the flavor of the thyme and the shallot. 
connect garlic to this. You can add some juniper to this. If you want to kind of spread it all together, so be happy. You just get all the juniper. Continue to paste. Paste is kind of going to really kind of just seep into the meat. I'll let it cook a little bit. Now, since this is sous vide, it's already cooked. Now, I'm just going to let it sit there with the butter and all the herbs and the shallots and just be nice and happy right there. Right? Back this. Let's see this some salt and pepper. Now we use white pepper when we do our purees. Just because I don't want to wrap the, the specks on it. The salt. As you can see, nice smooth syrup. Back to what we're looking for. Put that aside for now. Back to our floor. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna start our Brussels sprouts. So in the pan here, we're gonna take out the bacon. We're gonna keep the fat. Turn it up a little bit. We're going to take our Brussels sprouts. Okay. You can do really whatever you want to do. Sorry about that. Those technical difficulties. So I'm going to take these and we're going to kind of just julienne them a little. Okay. Always use a flat surface when you're doing that. Perfect. We're going to take that. We're going to add that right to the bacon fat. I'm going to help that little flavor along a little bit. Bacon and Brussels sprouts go together uh, like the best. I'm trying to think of an analogy that would work. They're like peanut butter and jelly. We just want to get them a little cooked. A little cooked, that's all. I still like texture to my vegetables. I'm not saying, hey, let's cook it too mushy. So I still want it to be really al dente. We have some mushrooms here. We have caminis. Fortunately, I know I put beach on the restroom, but beach wouldn't didn't come in. And unfortunately, that's kind of the things that we're dealing with. You order, it just doesn't come in. And, you know, so a lot of times as chefs, we got to think on the fly and how can we figure out what we're going to do next. So that happens, unfortunately, a good amount. So we're going to take our mushrooms. We're going to slice our mushrooms. We'll put a little oil in this pan. We got a little shallot. We're going to let that cook. Now we're going to move the pork over off the heat. We're just going to let it sit there and just rest now. 
That is beautiful. All right. That's just going to sit there and rest now until we're ready to plate up the meal. So, much of the saute, we're going to add a little bit of butter to them. I use a lot of butter because butter is just great. We're going to add a little masala wine. I'm a fan of masala. I'm a fan of Madeira, sherry wine. Any of those wines cooking in the glaze with mushrooms are fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. All right, we're going to get another little pot of water on, a little salt. We're just going to blanch some um, Brussels sprout leaves for garnish as well. Okay, we're going to grab our plate ready. We use a nice, since it's, you know, I don't know, October, Halloween, nice big black plate. Colors be cool, orange, black, green, cool, Halloween-ish. Okay, now that the pork has been resting, we're gonna kind of take off everything we have here. We have our hot glaze. I'm just gonna kind of just let that glaze just sit right on there. You see all the little herbs and spices. That's just gonna sit there. Okay, mushrooms are done. So we have our Brussels done, our mushrooms done. We got Brussels sprout leaves that are getting done. So we're going to just put them in some salted water. I just want to change the color. I'm not really looking to cook them all that much. I just want to get the nice green color out. That's really all I'm looking to do. All right. Now we can stop plating our pork chop. Shit. So now we're going to start with some sweet potato down. We we'll take our rake again. Rake's pretty cool. We buy these many of our vendors. We're going to kind of push that aside. We have our Brussels sprout leaves that we have when we end up. We're gonna put that down as our little base. La Dons. Chef, we're already getting a lot of comments. Everyone's loving the plate up. Excellent. Makes me happy. A little bit of little mushrooms there. Always like to take some of the extra blades, go around. 
even though it's the same color, the, the texture is what's gonna kind of help it. Okay. I always also like to finish off a little bit of olive oil in most of my plates. And we have our, we'll bring some more color into it. We have our Brussels sprout leaves. And we'll finish a little crest on here. We have some of that green, and that's it. Uh, absolutely stunning. I, I think we're I think we're breaking the internet right now, Chef. <laughs> so like the rake works great. Like we do the rake. You have fun with those things, right? They make those tools for pastries, but think pastry, think savory, and have fun with it. It's always great. A absolutely um, beautiful. Now, I guess speaking of that too, since I did see you using some of your um, other tools and things, what are some of the tools that you can't live without in your kitchen? Um, well, obviously the knife, my favorite. I, I have a problem. I buy knives all the time. My wife drives my wife crazy. <laughs> um, but um, Tweezers are great for little things. They're not made for everything. But the best thing in the kitchen is a good spoon. We use them for everything. Spoon, tweezers, you know, um, the combs. There's so many different things. But if I had to pick one thing I could not live without, it would be a good spoon. Because I can do everything with the spoon. Um, it's so important, so crucial, as simple as it is, too. You can go buy a, a $2 spoon. It's just big enough. It just, it can do everything. You can base, you can sauce, you can do everything with it. So that's my, that's my go-to, always. And fantastic. And um, in, in an ideal world, um, how many kitchen staff would the hotel have um, employed? Well, pre-pandemic we had, at this hotel, we had 27 in the kitchen, pre-pandemic. Now I have six. And <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. So that means you're looking for help. I'm sure some of the chefs and culinary students who might be tuning in today might be interested um, in getting the opportunity to learn from you and learn with you uh, at the hotel. So if, if that's the case, um, should they just go to the website? Yeah, we can you go to the website. Link. We're looking for we're looking for line cooks, we're looking for part-time cooks, we're looking for servers, people that want to do front of the house, back of the house. Uh, look me up on Instagram at Chef Nick Five Two. You'll see a lot of the food we do in the restaurant and the service and the promotional things. Um, I use it all for restaurants. Um, there's a lot that we do, um, but yeah, we we try to be creative. We try to be innovative. We try to always push the box, especially in the catering world. We never want to be. We want people to be like, oh, that's what we need to do. We don't want to be the one saying, oh, can we do that? What did they do? I like when people say what we we did and if they can do it. So we really try to push as much as we can, especially in our banking world where our, our um, I think our product is better than anybody else's. Excellent. And um, I'm sure that, you know, your staff is uh, has certifications and serve safe certifications. And yep. um, we know that you have um, many certifications as well. One of them that uh, some of the chefs were wondering about is what is CCA for those who are not involved? with Certified ACA? culinary administrator. So not only being a chef, you know how to cook. That's half of it. You have to know how to run a kitchen. You have to know what the numbers mean. Otherwise, you're just going to be a good cook. You're going to be a good sous chef. People, when restaurant tours and hotels entrust you as the executive chef, along with that goes the responsibility of making money for the position that you're in, making money for your owner, making money for your ownership or the, or the um, stockholders. So you have to understand what food cost is, labor cost is, productivity is, how to order correctly, how to source different vendors, how to get quotes, how to do all things. And the CCA piece is certified culinary administrator saying that, you know, as a chef, I can not only cook, I can then do this things as well. I can run an operation. I can run a kitchen. I can make you money. Because if you go into a kitchen, you're the executive chef and you're running a 35, 45% food cost, you're not gonna be a chef very long. Absolutely. Well, um, well, wonderful. We're going to wait for um, some of the other questions that were coming in. Um, again, I'm going to take this a, a pre pandemic world because I know that everything is a little bit crazy right now. But one of the chefs is wondering, 
um, I, how much a dish like that would sell for at your hotel. In my restaurant, I would sell up to about $37. In banquets, oh, I would, I would charge like $85, $90. Gotta love banquets. Three courses. <laughs> Amazing, and that that it's it's really beautiful. Now, was that the first iteration of this dish that you made, or as you were um, developing the recipe, were there certain other items that you that you were playing with that didn't didn't make the final cut? No, you know when I was making the menu, when I go into a menu development, I pretty much know what I want to do. I draw it a lot, so once I make that dish, I know that dish is what I want to do. So when I made this dish for the ACF in Pacific University and the Pro Start, everyone was. I knew I wanted to do pork. I knew I wanted to do sweet potato. Brussels sprouts is that time of year and mushrooms are always great. So I knew exactly in my head what I wanted to do. And I drew it a couple of times and I will say this is probably the first time I played it. Amazing, amazing. Well, it looks delicious. We wish we were all there with you in person. Um, yeah, but um, <laughs> as, we, um, as we begin to wrap up, I'm wondering, um, what other thoughts or, or final thoughts that you might wish to share with uh, everyone who's been tuning in today or watching the recording? Well, thank you for everyone that has tuned in. Um, it's been an honor being here to represent, again, uh, the Culinary Federation and the, and the restaurant associations, as well as uh, Smithfield Culinary. Um, it's been great. And one thing I can leave you with is if you love this field, get involved, get into this field. Call you and our your National Restaurant Association reps at between Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, wherever you are, wherever state you are, get involved. Find out what restaurants are participating in different pro stock invitationals and do stages at those restaurants and get involved in the community. Again, this isn't going away. We're in a tough time now, but we will bounce back. So just really, really, really think about what you ought to do and just do it. Don't worry about it. Everybody's hiring this. So to go, want help, wanted ads everywhere. You can find a job, pick the right one, and put forth that effort. Be exceptional. Choose to be exceptional. Don't choose to be ordinary. Because if you're exceptional, you will go very far, and everybody's going to want you. Well, that's amazing. Choose to be exceptional. Like de definitely words of wisdom, and hopefully that um, uh, resonating with everyone who's tuning in. But uh, a huge virtual uh, round of applause as we thank Chef Nick Callius. Um, we uh, we're just honored to have you here. That dish looks wicked good. Um, we know you're uh, we know you're busy, and so we appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here with all of us to share your skills and, and your enthusiasm for not only the culinary profession but also for the development of the future uh, culinary professionals. Um, and everyone has the recipe, so that, that's great too. I know there were a couple of people tuning in that were cooking along uh, a little bit shy to come on camera and show them, show us their dishes, but we hope that you'll email us pictures of your dishes too or post them on, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, and uh, feel free to hashtag ACF Chefs as well. And um, again, I um, hope everyone has some fun playing around in the kitchen with that dish and really making it their own as well. So please be on the lookout for a survey that you'll receive this week, which you'll need to complete in order to earn your one hour of ACF continuing education hours. Um, we hope that oh, you'll join sweet. us. <laughs> yes, yes. Do I get Absolutely. extra for cooking it? <laughs> we, we will certainly make sure you get your CEH as well, Chef. Um, and, uh, and we certainly invite um, you and everyone else tuning in to some of our upcoming webinars. We have an exciting webinar announcement for November, so please stay tuned for that shortly. Uh, however, in December, we'll also be collaborating with the James Beard Foundation to present a state of industry presentation based on their recent industry survey um, and mostly focusing in on independent restaurants and restaurateurs and, and kitchen staff. So you do not want to miss that. Uh, another Boston connection right here too. Dr. Jan is at Cornell University, but formerly of, uh, of, Newber of Newbury College. So. For more information, for culinary news, to register for upcoming webinars, please check out our website, wearechefs.com. And on behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you again to New Hampshire Pro Start, to Massachusetts Pro Start. A big shout out, of course, to our friends and uh, the sponsor, Smithfield Culinary. Um, and of course, thank you again, Chef Nick, for bringing us this delicious learning opportunity. And thank you all for joining us today. We'll see you real soon. Have a great day. Thank you.